Welcome back to the Jones Zone, where uh, we're going to be getting into various topics about the Bible. Yep, now let me first just say that in my last video, I was presenting the argument of why Christians don't keep to the Sabbath. And that reason still is valid, but I didn't present the right scripture that confirms this, which is in Colossians chapter 2, uh, verse 14 through 17, states, Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So this means that Christ has fulfilled the law. And by fulfill, this means to satisfy, to end, or to expire. In verse 16, it says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. 17 is, These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. I Meaning that what is most important is your faith in Christ. That's what you must focus on. We don't focus on shadows. We focus on the reality. It says the reality is Christ here. Okay, now I'm going to put this into a historical context to explain why God would have required the Sabbath. Okay, now in those days, many nations adopted a rest day, a day free from labor so that crops would be collected and sold on the market. This is what we would particularly see with the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans when these empires would eventually come to dominate Israel. Yeah, okay, so Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he seized Israel, and then he walked through there. All right, you know, as if he was owning the place. Dominated the Israelis, took them out of their homes. And of course, as we know, they went back to uh, Babylon with him, and then came Cyrus. Yeah, Cyrus the Great of Persia came and he broke the yoke of the Babylonian Empire. Okay, He had them Persian knights driving them Babylonians before him. You know, they came in riding them horses and everything. They had that chain mail. Yes, they actually had chain mail then, but mostly the army would have had leather at that time until centuries later when they did start upgrading their military and everything. But yeah, they rode through them and they had chain mail. They had horses and stuff like that. And they drove those Babylonians before them. On them horses with them spears stabbing down. Mm, you know, yeah. Okay. Maybe get them a warrior mode now. But anyways. Okay. So, getting back to my point. The first day of rest was a human law. This, this was all about business, people. Now, with that being said, God understands the traditions of the nations of the earth. So at that time, he wouldn't command his people to operate in a world in such a way that would get them persecuted by the authorities. And so, for the time being, it makes sense that he would have his people obey the day of rest, which is the Sabbath. And in which better way for him to ensure that than to have his people obey this in the form of a commandment until the time of fulfillment when Christ would triumph over these powers and authorities that are human, thus doing away with the Sabbath. And so henceforth, you will not be judged for disobeying the Sabbath. Now, where I was wrong is when I said Christ had fully fulfilled God's promise to the Israelites by establishing an all-encompassing new covenant. That part is simply not true. I know, I know, shame on me. But this is what happens when you have a bias and you're married to a particular idea or ideology. Uh, you get tunnel vision. And you see what you want to see. All right. But again, I'm going to admit that I was wrong about a few things in my last video. Christ did not fully fulfill the Old Covenant for the purpose of replacing it with the church for all Christians. No. Uh, his new covenant is still for Israel. And the Bible tells us that God is not finished with Israel and the house of Judah. And this is clearly stated in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 35 to 37. 
Now, I'm going to use the new international version uh, moving forward uh, for this verse, uh, this chapter, uh, because it's written clear for understanding. Okay, we got a lot of thous and thous and thou not this and um, all this kind of stuff. It can, it can be confusing to your everyday speaker of English. Uh, so, that's another thing, uh, is that, you know, we need to stop being married to a particular version of the Bible, like the King James Version. There are no fundamental differences in the different versions of the Bible. I mean, there are no fundamental differences, okay? But for now, I'll admit, um, is that I will avoid the revised versions because I just don't like the sound of it. I mean, but that's just that's just me. It's my prerogative. All right, but um, Jeremiah uh, chapter 31, uh, verses 35 to 37, and it is written, This is what the Lord says, He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord Almighty is His name. 36, only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will Israel ever cease being a nation before me. This is what the Lord says. Only if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below be searched out, will I reject all the descendants of Israel because of all that they've done, declares the Lord. And so there it is written. God will not condemn Israel until the heavens have been measured, uh, which is not possible if we're literally talking about heaven because heaven is a spiritual realm that cannot be measured by the physical. But if we're talking about measuring the heavens as in the stars that are in this night sky, I mean, we can't do that either because the stars are so numerous, we cannot count them all. And even if we could, well, I don't think we'd be able to know their actual dimensions either. But science will have you believe that we do. You know, they'll be like, oh, yeah, there are this many stars in the universe and in the galaxy and uh, blah, 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 and give you a little estimate. And then they'll go into their theoretical models and all that. And you know what? I will save this topic for another video. So I'll keep it moving for now. So, yeah, moving on. Next, I'm going to bring to your attention a point in the Bible that shows God condemning the Israelites for their atrocities committed against Christ and his prophets. But despite all of this, God still extends his mercy to the Israelites. In Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 to 39, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, for I say unto you, Ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Alright, so, uh, Israelites, I'm sure you're probably feeling on top of the world at the moment, but uh, what you should actually be feeling is contrition. That's what you should actually be feeling. And here's the thing. And then after the Israelites repent, God will fulfill his promise to the Israelites by giving them the lands that he said he would. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 18 through 21, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying unto thy seed, Have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, and the Kenizzites, and the Cadmonites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Raphaim, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Gergesites, and the Jebusites. Okay? Now, you're talking about the Hittites. You're talking about Turkey now. So, that's that's interesting. But anyways, uh, following these events, Christ will return, and he'll kick off the millennial rule, which is confirmed in Luke Chapter 1, verses 31 to 33. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. 
And once again, let me confirm that Christians will be a part of that equation. More specifically, they will be subjects in this great kingdom to come, which is mentioned in Isaiah uh, chapter 42, verse 6. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. And by Gentiles, that would be Christians and pagans, or anyone who isn't an Israelite. All right, everyone. So this is it. I've corrected everything. And it is as it is written in the name of the Lord. Okay. And with that, I'd just like to close out with, Oh, Lord, you deserve all the glory and the power forever and ever.